Welcome everyone to the end of a corrupt and criminal presidential term. The sitting president has threatened, lied, spied on, and secretly courted everyone from allies to enemies, and the walls of impeachment are closing in around him. Leading the charge is the free press, the one institution above his constant degradation, and the only one left willing to investigate the most powerful man in the world. Today we're looking at Watergate from Capstone Games, a two-player card-driven game set in the waning months of the Nixon administration. Why? Who did you think I was talking about? The cover art here ranks among my favorites that I've ever seen. It perfectly evokes the theme as well as the gameplay style. First up inside is the rule book, which is much thicker than it needs to be. Only the first 10 pages are dedicated to setup and teaching the game, while the rest is chock-a-block with incredibly detailed information on all the players in the scandal, as well as a timeline of Watergate itself, and even some historical context for the event. It's marvelous as a teaching aid, and I'm absolutely in love with the attention to detail here. Past that is the game's board, brilliantly designed and laid out exactly like every conspiracy theory court board in every every movie or TV show. It's even replete with bits of flavor like the campaign propaganda and newspaper clippings. Now we come to the much sadder section, the awful insert. There's an adage I've heard a couple of times in board gaming that the worse the insert, the better the game, and that certainly holds true here. While the cloth evidence bag holds the evidence tokens, and there's a single baggie for the influence and momentum tokens, everything else is forced to just live in limbo inside the box, including these really excellent oversized cards. Let's just skirt past this disappointing development and get to the game, shall we? Here we are all set up. The player playing the Washington Post starts with initiative and five cards in their hand from the top of their deck. Nixon starts with just four, meaning that the editor will play both first and last. Both players alternate playing cards from their hand until neither has any left. The object is different for both players. That's right, buddies, this is an asymmetrical card game, one of my absolute favorite mechanics. The editor of the Washington Post is trying to connect Nixon to two informants using evidence pinned on the board in three different colors. All they have to do is get two of the game's seven conspirators to talk to them and then follow the money back to Tricky Dick himself. Nixon, on the other hand, is trying to get those conspirators first and buy their loyalty long enough to get five influence tokens and survive to the end of his term. If he can hold off the post long enough, he'll ride off into the sunset with no one ever knowing. The main battle in this game is going to be over the evidence tokens. They start out here on the zero space directly in between the two players. Once either player causes them to move toward themselves, they'll flip over, revealing their color. The color on the token corresponds to one of the three sections on the map where they can be placed, linking Nixon to a conspirator. Not only do the journalists need to complete a full path, but they also need to get that informant to turn on Nixon. And there's only one card in each player's deck for each informant. If Nixon plays his card first, he's secured their loyalty and therefore silence of that conspirator. If the Post can convince them that giving up the truth is best for the country, then they'll become active and willing to work with them. Most of the game's tokens work on this duality. Each side of the tokens is either in color, meaning useful for the newspaper, or redacted, meaning that the full power of the president has been brought to bear. Neither is necessarily permanent, though, which means that even if Nixon manages to somehow silence all seven informants, it's not necessarily game over. Nixon's job is to deny the Post the evidence they need, and also to win five of the game's influence markers by having them on his side of the board at round's end. If it ends the round anywhere here, Nixon will claim it for himself and be that much closer to winning. So, how does it play? Remarkably well. Comparisons have been made to Twilight Struggle given the two-player nature of the game and the political theme. I see why the comparison is made, but they're vastly different games. First of all, the playtime for Watergate is 30 to 45 minutes, meaning that you'll be able to play at least two, if not three games of this in the time it takes you to decide one contest of Twilight Struggle. Secondly, the focus of Watergate is much leaner than the other game, meaning that you're really quite laser focused on the evidence and influence tokens above all other concerns. Playing one card at a time means you'll still get to instantly react to your opponent's moves and counter moves, making this a more tactical game than a strategic one. There's still strategy here, though, for those of you looking for that. As Nixon shuts off avenues of discovery from the Post, they'll have to adapt their evidence gathering away from those colors towards one that provide more hope. As the Post closes the net on Nixon, he's got more information to play with. After all, only he knows what evidence is in every round until someone tries to move it, which gives Nixon a significant heads up when the game is on the line. 
If the Post desperately needs a blue piece of evidence and there's only one on the table, Nixon would be wise to start their first turn of the round moving that particular piece as close to him as he can get it. Everything's dictated by your hand, so there's a small element of randomness that works against this game in a little way, and also in a bigger one. The small issue is that because there are only 20 cards in your deck, you're generally going to see the one you need within four rounds or so. The larger issue stems from the same source, but gets in the way of replayability. Again, with a deck of only 20 cards, you're going to learn them quickly and know what's in there. This feels like a huge bummer when you start, but you have to keep in mind that each deck is different, and playing each side is similarly different enough that you're not going to bore of this title as fast as you think you will. Additionally, the balance of this game is so tight that winning or losing often comes down to one or two plays. We've had games where Nixon was able to secure the last piece of evidence away from the Post just as they also nabbed their fifth influence token, and also had games where the Post snatched the winning marker just before Nixon could score the winning influence. Every single game of Watergate feels incredibly tense, which is amazing given how little there is here. Capstone has done an absolutely phenomenal job marrying theme and mechanics here, and every bit of work shines through. Watergate is a tense experience, balanced on a ballpoint pen and with playtime perfectly poised at a precious 30 to 45 minutes. While it's not the perfect two-player game, there's more than enough in this small box to check you back into the Watergate Hotel again and again. Let's go through the checklist. In the box, rulebook clear and non-gender pronouns. As previously mentioned, the rulebook is great from both an historical perspective as well as a gaming one. It does a very clear and very thematic job of teaching you how to play in only seven pages and does so while referring to the players as you rather than he, despite the historical pedigree. Iconography clear. The difference between the momentum token and the influence token can get a little confusing in your first few plays, but there's a helpful guide right on the cards. The only other iconography, as it were, is only the game's three colors, which might get slightly confusing for colorblind players. Packaging well done. This isn't great, as everything just gets kind of slapdashed into the box with no baggie for the cards or the informant tokens. The box will hold the cards sleeved, but the cards themselves are of an odd size, so finding sleeves might be tough. On the table, good representation. The game's characters are lifted directly out of the history books, and while the White House of the 1970s was far less gender equal than it is today, still, Nixon's secretary Rosemary Woods features strongly in this game, so it's not a complete boys club. Component quality. Above average. The wooden tokens feel great, and while the evidence board tokens are just standard punch, they work well and should last a long time. The game's cards are standard fare as well, just sleeve them up and they'll be with you longer than Nixon was. Replay value. Again, above average. While there's only 20 cards for each player, the roles are asymmetrical enough that there's plenty to play through, and the actual tug of war between the post and the president is so well balanced that even if you know the cards backwards, they're still fun to be had here. Fun to lose. Oh yes. Since the goals of the two players are different, there isn't really a runaway leader issue. You can think you're walking away with it on either side, and all it takes is a few well-timed cards, and now you're telling your friends that they'll be sorry because they won't have you to kick around anymore. Watergate is an absolutely fantastic two-player game that captures the essence of the Watergate affair perfectly. The give-and-take nature of pushing evidence around is fun and gives both players some serious consequences to think about while playing. Overall, if you're looking for a game for yourself and just one other person, and you're a history buff at all, this title is easily worthy of a spot on your shelf. I'm Nicholas, reminding you to help protect the game population. Always leave your cards. <laughs>